Hello everyone, this is Dr. Govind Rai Gar. In this video, we will discuss the questions that were asked in the FMG exam of January 2024. Okay, so starting with the first question, which of the following can result in acute liver failure? So the options given are of mostly poisoning. We have organophosphate poisoning, morphine poisoning, belladonna poisoning and amanita poisoning, which cause liver failure. So we will see one by one organophosphate poisoning. We know organophosphates like malathion, parathion, they are acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. So by inhibiting this enzyme, they increase the level of acetylcholine. When acetylcholine level increases, there will be cholinergic symptoms. So cholinergic symptoms like there is pinpoint pupil. There is meiosis leading to pinpoint pupil. There will be increase in all these secretions. So there will be salivation, lacrimation. There will be diarrhea, loose motions. All of them will be there. So these are the main symptoms. Plus usually there is some muscle weakness also because of stimulation of nicotinic receptors. So usually organophosphate poisoning, liver failure is not seen. Okay. Then second is morphine poison. We know morphine. Morphine stimulate the mu, kappa and delta receptors. And the actions of mu receptors you can remember from the sacrum. So in morphine poisoning, there are symptoms related to sacrum. S means sedation. So person will be highly sedated, maybe in comatose state. Plus there is depression of cardiovascular system, which can lead to bradycardia, hypotension, etc. Then A means analgesia, morphine cause loss of pain. So it is used for uh, conditions like acute myocardial infarction, cancer associated pain. Then C means constipation. So in the poisoning, there will be absent bowel sounds. R means respiratory depression. So person will have decreased respiratory rate. Respiratory depression will be there. Euphoria means morphine is an addictive drug. And M means meiosis. Meiosis means there will be again pinpoint pupil. So again, morphine poisoning do not cause acute liver failure. Then we have belladonna poisoning. So belladonna and dhatura, they are the two sources of atropine. So belladonna poisoning or dhatura poisoning, the symptoms you can remember from dhatura. Dhatura, belladonna, atropine poisoning are same thing. So D means dryness of mouth plus delirium plus dilation of pupil. That means mitriasis. These are same. Then H is hyperthermia a is agitation t is tachycardia u r is urinary retention so person will have urinary retention and a means accommodation is lost so that can lead to blurred vision so these are the feature in belladonna poisoning so there will be no acute liver failure Okay. So the ruling out option last amanita phalloid toxicity. So it is a mushroom which can cause liver failure. So in amanita phalloid poisoning, there is acute liver failure. In other three conditions, liver failure is not seen. Okay. So the answer is D. Okay. Moving to next question. Which of the following factors can decrease iron absorption? So this I taught you in the lectures also. Iron absorption is very important. So if we see the iron, some factors increase the absorption of iron and some factors decrease the absorption of iron. The factors which increase the absorption of iron, you need to remember about two main things. One is reducing substances. Reducing substances like ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid or vitamin C. We know ascorbic acid is vitamin C. Remember, that's why iron is always taken with citrus fruits like orange juice because the ascorbic acid present there increase the absorption of iron. Okay. Second, the gastric acid, gastric hydrochloric acid also increase the absorption of iron. So you need to remember about these. Then factors which decrease the absorption of iron. These include phytates, oxalates, and tannates. Now phytates and oxalates are present in food. So we avoid taking iron tablet with food. Food decreases the absorption and tannates are present in tea, coffee. So tea should not be taken with iron tablets. So that will decrease the absorption. 
Okay, so now we will come to the options. Vitamin C increase the absorption of iron. T decrease the absorption of iron. So that will be the answer here. Sprouts contain phytate, but during sprouting, the phytate content is reduced. So it do not affect the absorption of iron. Gastric acid increase the absorption of iron. So question is, which decrease? So answer will be T. So it is very important. Do not drink tea after taking iron tablets. Give some time for the absorption to occur. Okay. The next question, a female had unprotected sexual intercourse and now more than five days have passed. She fears getting pregnant. What is the contraceptive of choice? So when we see emergency contraception, so emergency contraception, you can divide into three parts. Number one, those which need to be given within 72 hours. Within 72 hours, they will be effective. These include combined oral contraceptives. So these are the pills which are normal estrogen progesterone pills. Two tablets to be taken now, then two tablets after 12 hours. But that should be within 72 hours of unprotected intercourse. Then second thing we can use is Mifepristone. Mifepristone. Third thing we can use is progesterone only pill or levonorgestrel. Levonorgestrel. So these are the three which has to be used within 72 hours. Then which can be used up to 120 hours. That means up to five days. Up to five days. So that is only one drug which is a Uliprestar. Uliprestar. Uliprestal is selective progesterone receptor modulator. A single 30 milligram tablet, it can give protection from pregnancy if used within five days of unprotected intercourse. Now, if a female is coming after that, so up to five to ten days, so only thing which can protect here are the intrauterine contraceptive devices like copper tea. So if we insert copper tea, that can protect even after five days. But the efficacy is not that great, but it can protect. Okay. So the within 72 hours, we have combined OCPs, Mifepristone and Levonorgestrel. Up to five days, we have Uliprestal. And after that, we have IUCD. Okay. So here it is more than five days. So answer will be IUCD. Okay. Next question. A two-month pregnant female presented with Plasmodium vivax malaria, which is the appropriate treatment? So there are several things here. Number one, there is pregnancy, first trimester, two-month old. Number two, there is vivax malaria. Okay. So first of all, we will see what is the treatment of malaria, which is very important for MCQs. So we have two types of malaria, Plasmodium vivax malaria and Plasmodium falciparum malaria. So we are talking about uncomplicated. Then we have complicated malaria, which is mostly caused by Plasmodium falciparum. Now the drug of choice for Plasmodium vivax malaria normally is chloroquine. And for falciparum malaria, it is artemisinin combination therapy. But vivax malaria, we need to do the radical cure also. So we add primaquine. primaquine. So this is without pregnancy in a normal person. So chloroquine plus primaquine is for vivax and ACT for falciparum malaria. Uncomplicated malaria we are talking. Now second thing, we are talking about malaria in pregnancy. Malaria in pregnancy, the first trimester. First trimester. In first trimester pregnancy, chloroquine is safe. But primaquine is not safe. So chloroquine without primaquine is a drug of choice. Without primaquine. Okay. Whereas in falciparum malaria, ACT is not safe in first trimester. So we give quinine. quinine. Now quinine is normally used in falciparum malaria. But if chloroquine is not in the options, quinine can be used in vivax malaria also. Okay. Then third thing is pregnancy second and third trimester. Pregnancy second trimester and third trimester. Remember chloroquine is safe. But again, primaquine is not safe. So here it is chloroquine. Without primaquine again, without primaquine, primaquine cannot be given in any trimester of pregnancy. But ACT is safe in third trimester. ACT is safe in second and third trimester. So in first trimester for vivax malaria, we have chloroquine without primaquine. 
now complicated malaria whether it is uh, first trimester second trimester pregnancy non pregnancy everywhere the treatment of complicated malaria is intravenous artesunate this is a serious case so we have to give iv artesunate okay so now coming to the options so in the options if we see there is first trimester pregnancy and they are asking about vivex malaria so answer should be chloroquine but we see chloroquine plus primaquine cannot be the answer we have to give chloroquine without primaquine act is contraindicated and we know doxycycline is contraindicated in pregnancy it is a tetracycline so by default the answer will become quinine normally quinine is used for falciparum malaria but if chloroquine is we cannot use with primaquine so if option is not there we can use quinine in pregnancy so answer by ruling out will be quinine okay moving to next question which adverse effect is least likely to be associated with amiodarone so this is a repeated question we discussed several times the adverse effects of amiodarone you can remember as the periphery of my lung and cornea is photosensitive so the th stand for thyroid so anything can happen hyper bhi ho sakta hai hypo peripheral neuropathy myocardial depression myocardial depression it will depress the heart lung fibrosis pulmonary fibrosis can occur corneal deposits it can get deposited in the cornea and it can cause photosensitivity which can cause blue colored rash on the face so that is known as blue man syndrome okay so these are the important side effects of amiodarone so if we see the options the side effects of amiodarone hypo or hyperthyroidism can occur pulmonary fibrosis can occur so gynecomastia is not caused by amiodarone gynecomastia this is the answer gynecomastia is development of male breasts and the important drugs which cause gynecomastia we discussed several times earlier the drugs causing gynecomastia remembered as yes they are disco drugs disco drugs cause gynecomastia so di for digoxin so digoxin can cause gynecomastia s means pyronolactone C means cimetidin. K means ketoconazole. And O means estrogens or female hormones. So these can cause gynecomastia. Amiodarone do not cause gynecomastia. Okay. Moving to next question. A patient presented with the ptosis, drooping of eyelid, which gets worsened by evening. So this is suggestive of muscle weakness which is increasing by the days usually myasthenia gravis so he was diagnosed to be a case of myasthenia gravis so it is confirmed so what is the preferred treatment we know a patient of myasthenia gravis it is an autoimmune disease for treatment of myasthenia gravis we usually use the drugs which are acetylcholinesterase inhibitors like neostigmine or pyridostigmine read carefully we use neostigmine or pyridostigmine on the other hand a drug similar to pyridostigmine the name is physostigmine physostigmine is used in atropine poisoning it is not used in myasthenia gravis because the name says it is lipid soluble so means soluble because it is lipid soluble it can cross the membranes enter the brain cause central side effects we do not want that so we use neostigmine or pyridostigmine commonly they are given along with atropine to avoid the muscarinic side effects okay then which drug is used to diagnose myasthenia gravis to differentiate between myasthenia and cholinergic crisis yes everyone knows that is adrophonia so adrophonium is used for diagnosis of myasthenia gravis now apart from using this which are the mainstay of treatment we can also give the drugs which are immunosuppressants because they it is an autoimmune disease so we can use the drugs like prednisolone steroids can be used 
we can also use the drugs which are other immunosuppressants like we can use cyclosporin also but they are alternative drugs the main drug is neostigmine or pyridostigmine okay so coming to the options so which drug is used answer will be pyridostigmine read carefully not physostigmine it is pyridostigmine okay so that is about myasthenia gravis moving to next question a pregnant female who is a known case of bronchial asthma presented to hospital with bp of 160 by 100 which is the preferred treatment so if you see carefully read the question carefully again i told you repeatedly remember puja okay so read carefully so why <clears throat> number one there is pregnancy there is hypertension now many students would have jumped directly drug of choice for hypertension in pregnancy is yes labitalone do not jump because patient is having asthma also so we have important thing which antihypertensive drug can be used in pregnancy also and can is safe in asthma also so we have to use these two things so first of all which antihypertensive drugs are safe in pregnancy so we remember them as better mother care during hypertensive pregnancy these are the safe drugs in pregnancy so these include BET stand for beta blockers so beta blockers like labital non-selective beta blockers like labital so non-selective alpha plus beta blocker or cardio selective beta blockers are also safe then M is methyl dope methyl dope C is clonidine D are dipins the drugs whose name end with the dipin like nifedipin, nicardipin, amlodipin they are safe then hy is hydralazine hydralazine and pr is parajosin so these are the antihypertensive drugs which are safe in pregnancy so first criteria these are safe but which drugs are absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy these are AC inhibitor that means any drug whose name end with pril and ARBs any drug whose name end with the sartan. So prills and sartans are contraindicated. So we will see our first step which drug out of these we can use. So labitalol we can use in pregnancy. Labitalol we can use in pregnancy. Propranolol is a non-selective beta blocker. It is avoided in pregnancy. Okay. So nifedipine we can use in pregnancy. But the question is asthma. Remember, we know if a drug block beta receptor, it can worsen asthma. Remember, beta blockers are avoided in ABCD. ABCD. What is ABCD? A for asthma. They are avoided. B means bradycardia. They are avoided. C means CHF, which is acute CHF. They are avoided. And D means diabetes mellitus. They are avoided. So beta blockers are avoided in ABCD. So beta blocker means drugs ending with the load. So if a drug is ending with the load, it is contraindicated in bronchial asthma. So we see labitalol, oral as well as intravenous. Propranolol, it is avoided in asthma. So the only drug which is remaining is nifedipin. So nifedipin is safe in asthma also and pregnancy also. So among these drugs, we will prefer nifedipin. Okay, now next question. Drug of choice for acute rheumatic fever. So easy question. So person is having fever. So for treatment of fever, we have used use NSAIDs, NSAIDs like aspirin. So aspirin is a drug of choice for acute rheumatic fever. And not only it treats the fever, but it also decreases the other manifestations like carditis. It, it stops the other inflammatory manifestations also. Digoxin is used in congestive heart failure. Nothing to do with rheumatic fever. Amiodron is anti-arrhythmic drug. And furosemide is a diuretic which is used in cases of edema like in patient with congestive heart failure. So they are not used in acute cases of rheumatic fever. Here we will use aspirin. Okay, the next question, what is the mechanism of action of thiazide in DCT? So DCT they have already given. So what is the mechanism of action? So here you will quickly revise the mechanism of action and site of action of different diuretics. So if we make a glomerulus, 
this is proximal tip view then we have loop of end we have collecting that after the distal tubules so here in the proximal tubule there is presence of an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase so carbonic anhydrase inhibitors they work in proximal convoluted tubules so drugs whose name end with zolamide like acetazolamide dorzolamide brinzolamide they work in proximal tubule then we have thick ascending limb of loop of henle this contain a transporter which is sodium potassium 2 chloride pump it is sodium potassium 2 chloride pump so this transporter is present so this is inhibited by loop diuretics loop diuretics like furosemide so furosemide inhibit sodium potassium 2 chloride pump in ascending limb of loop of henle then in the distal tubules we have presence of sodium chloride pump so there is a pump which help in absorption of sodium and chloride so thiazides are the one which inhibit this so thiazide they work in dct distal convoluted tubule they inhibit sodium chloride pump and lastly in the collecting duct in the collecting duct we have a pump which help in absorption of sodium this is known as epithelial sodium pump this pump is inhibited by amyloride and triamterene amyloride and triamterene they inhibit epithelial sodium pump and this pump is stimulated by aldosterone and this aldosterone receptor is blocked by drugs like spironolactone spironolactone and a brother of spironolactone called as aplerolone they inhibit aldosterone receptors okay so this is the mechanism and site of action of different diuretics so coming here dct thiazide work what is the mechanism they inhibit sodium chloride transporter so that is the answer blockade of sodium potassium 2 chloride pump is done by loop diuretic but they work in loop of henle aldosterone receptor is blocked by drugs like spironolactone it is in the collecting ducts blocked of ethylene sodium channel is done by amyloride and again it is working in the collecting duct not in the dct okay so the answer is sodium chloride pump inhibitors now next question a patient was given 0.5 percent bupivacaine for brachial plexus block after some the time the patient developed hypotension and cardiovascular collapse what is the best treatment so this is a classical case of local anesthetic systemic toxicity so when we give local anesthetically um, for the local function but it enter the blood so it can cause toxicity to heart and brain so the person may develop seizures person may develop cardiovascular collapse so that is known as local anesthetic systemic toxicity and first of all we need to do the cardiopulmonary resuscitation for them obviously the person is going to die so we need to do cpr and the drug of choice for this is 20 percent intralipid so basically in the lipid portion the local anesthetic will be tracked so that will treat the toxicity so 20 percent intralipid is the answer for this question okay next question a chronic alcoholic patient with alcoholic liver disease was given some anti-amoebic drug and the patient presented with nausea vomiting flushing and hypotension now this we discussed several times this is a classical case of disulfiram like reaction so what happens basically when a person drink alcohol person is a chronic alcoholic so he must have taken alcohol so alcohol is converted to aldehyde in case of ethyl alcohol which the person normally consumes it will be converted to acetaldehyde the enzyme is alcohol dehydrogenase alcohol dehydrogenase now this aldehyde is converted to acid so in this case it is acetic acid so acetic acid is formed by acetaldehyde dehydrogen now l Acetic acid is not causing any problem. It is converted to acetate ions, which are normal buffers in the blood. So that is not causing problem, but the problem is caused by this. So if we give a drug which inhibit this enzyme, acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, then after taking alcohol, there will be accumulation of aldehyde and that will lead to all these symptoms which are given, nausea, vomiting, flushing and hypotension. So that is normally done by a drug called as disulfiram. 
so disulfiram normally cause these symptom so it is used for quitting alcohol so disulfiram is used as a drug which is known as alcohol aversion therapy alcohol aversion therapy now this drug we are using intentionally so that the person do not consume alcohol but suppose another drug inhibiting same enzyme acetaldehyde dehydrogenase but the person is not taking for de-addiction so if the person consume alcohol same problem will occur so that is called as disulfiram like reaction so which drugs will cause disulfiram like reaction aldehyde dehydrogenase inhibitor and which are aldehyde dehydrogenase inhibitor you can remember them as cyclic gmp drugs causing disulfiram like reaction these include c4 c4 pyrazone which is an antibiotic g4 griseofulvic which is an antifungal drug m4 metronidazole which is an anti amoebic drug this person is taking anti amoebic drug most likely metronidazole and p is procarbazid so all these drugs they can cause disulfiram like reaction okay so if we come to the uh, question chronic alcoholic patient so person must have consumed alcohol after taking anti amoebic drug metronidazole like drug develop these symptoms so it is likely to be disulfiram like reaction okay delirium tremen is alcohol withdrawal so if the person is not taking alcohol then the symptoms like tachycardia palpitation seizures they will happen so it will not cause hypotension flushing these symptoms okay and psychosis symptoms are totally different so there is hallucination delusions all these symptoms are there which are not seen here okay so answer is disulfiram like reaction okay a 40 year old obese female obese female presented with schizophrenia which of the following antipsychotic drug causes least weight gain so one of the major problem with antipsychotic drugs particularly atypical antipsychotic drugs is weight gain yeah. So, if we see antipsychotic drugs, they may be typical. So, typical drugs like chlorpromazine, haloperidol, etc. There, the, there are some drugs called as atypical. So, atypical drugs, they include drugs whose name end with PIN, like Clozapin, Olenzapin, Quetapin, Zotepin, Asinapin, PINs. And then drugs whose name end with DUN, like we have drugs like Risperidon, Peliperidon. Zipra Sidon, Lura Sidon. So these are the drugs, and apart from that, we have another drug called as Eripiprazole. Eripiprazole. Okay. So these are the atypical drugs. Now, atypical drugs as a group, they cause a side effect which is called as lipodystrophy syndrome. Lipodystrophy syndrome, also called as metabolic syndrome. So there will be metabolic features like there will be weight gain, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, etc. These are the side effects of atypical drugs as a group. But weight gain can be caused by typical drugs also like chlorpromazine, haloperidol. They also cause weight gain. Okay? Now what is important thing to remember, maximum weight gain is caused by these two drugs. Clozapin and olanzapine cause maximum weight gain. Maximum weight gain is caused by clozapine and olanzapine, whereas minimum side of these side effects are caused by ziprasidone and eripiprazole. Eripiprazole. So in Hindi you can remember that, are, are, shipra ko dekho, uska weight nahi bada. Are, zipra ka weight nahi bada. So are and zipra. Eripiprazole and ziprasidone do not cause weight gain. Okay. So if we see the option chlorpromazine can cause weight gain, clozapine or lenzapine cause maximum. So the answer will be ziprasidone. Ziprasidone has least weight gain. Another drug which causes least weight gain is eripiprazole. Okay. 
नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन अ 53 ईयर ओल्ड मेल प्रेजेंटेड विद टाइप 2 डायबिटीज मेलाइटिस व्हिच एंटी डायबिटिक ड्रग एक्ट बाय कॉजिंग ग्लूकोज यूरिया सो दैट इज द टिपिकल निमोनिक वी डिस्कस सो द ड्रग्स हुज नेम एंड विद ग्लीफ्लोजिन आई टोल्ड यू जस्ट राइट यूरिन एट द एंड दैट विल बिकम द निमोनिक सो व्हाट इज दे आर सेइंग दे आर सेइंग दैट ग्लूकोज फ्लोस इन यूरिन so they act by causing flow of glucose in the urine so basically these are the drugs which are sglt2 inhibitors sglt2 inhibitors now sglt2 is a sodium glucose transporter which is present in the proximal tubules if you see this is all glomerulus these are proximal tubules then we have loop of nla distal tubule and so on so here there is presence of a pump called as sglt so here sodium and glucose are reabsorbed so glucose is filtered then 100% reabsorbed from this pump so if we inhibit this pump then glucose will not be reabsorbed so glucose will be excreted that will lead to decrease in blood sugar so this is done by drugs which are called as glyphlosins so glyphlosins are sglt2 inhibitors the glyphlosin examples are drugs like empagliflozin canagliflozin dapagliflozin so any drug ending with glyphlosin is causing glucose urea so what will be the most common side effect of these drugs yes yes utis because the bacteria will enter to take the glucose so utis are the most common side effect of glyphlosins so the question asked which cause glucose urea they are asking which is ending with the glyphlosin so answer is empagliflozin okay then other drugs if you see quickly a carbose the name says it inhibit the absorption of carbohydrates it act by inhibiting the intestinal absorption of carbohydrates by inhibiting the enzyme alpha glucosidase glipizide is a sulfonyl urea it act by releasing insulin cetagliptin is a dpp4 inhibitor it inhibit this enzyme so there is less metabolism of glp1 and when glp1 increases that will release insulin okay so the answer is glyphlosin okay a six year old child with a previous history of gtcs presents with convulsions which are ongoing since 45 minutes what should be the manner so read carefully again remember puja here read carefully the question is not about gtcs the baby is having a history of gtcs but now what is happening he is having convulsions which are ongoing since 45 minutes if the convulsion continue for a long period so this is a case of status epilepticus status epilepticus so the drug of choice for status epilepticus is immediate treatment with intravenous lorazepam if lorazepam is not in the option then you can give dizepam also but lorazepam is the preferred drug for status epilepticus so after managing the case with intravenous lorazepam we will give a long acting drug for further management so the long acting drug we can start is either levetiracetam or we can start valproate or we can start phenobarbitone or we can give any other drug which is used for management of gtcs okay so lorazepam to start with then manage with the long acting drug now if we see the options lorazepam first yes followed by levetiracetam yes this is the answer the other option if we say valproate no valproate will not treat the acute seizures similarly which is for absence either not for gtcs not effective at all so both cannot be the answer and again carbamazepine will not treat acute seizure so gabapentin can be used for maintenance but for acute seizure we have to use lorazepam okay so the simple question asked here is drug of choice for status epilepticus okay a 58 year old male hypertensive patient was taking hydrochlorothiazide he developed fatigue and hypokalemia which drug can be added to prevent loss of potassium so basically the question asked is which is a potassium sparing diuretic so you can remember from our mnemonic that is paste remember we discussed that paste so paste stand for potassium sparing diuretics potassium sparing diuretics they are amyloride 
spirono lecton trium tiri and apliro these are potassium sparing diuretics so they are added with thiazides or loop diuretics to prevent the loss of potassium okay so if we see furosemide is a loop diuretic it cause hypokaline acetazolamide is a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor it also cause hypokalemia amyloride is epithelial sodium channel blocker and this is a potassium sparing diuretic remember amyloride is present here it is a potassium sparing diuretic and adenosine is anti arrhythmic drug it is drug of choice for psvt it is not given for potassium okay so the answer here will be amyloride okay a pregnant female in first trimester developed dvt she require anticoagulation which is the preferred drug. so which drug will you use for anticoagulation in first trimester yeah. so we all know anticoagulant of choice in pregnancy is heparins heparins are anticoagulant of choice in pregnancy so heparins can be unfractionated heparin or they can be low molecular weight heparin and low molecular weight heparin their name also end with the parin but before parin there will be something else apart from he so parins like inoxa parin delti parin tinza parin they are low molecular weight heparin so all of them are safe in pregnancy so if you see the answer will be inoxa parin which is a low molecular weight heparin clopidogrel is not anti coagulant it is anti platelet drug Betrixavan is also factor 10 inhibitor. It is also antiplatelet, not anticoagulant. And warfarin is contraindicated in pregnancy. So the answer will be inoxaparin. Okay. A patient of schizophrenia was started on antipsychotic drug, haloperidol. Few hours later, he presented with the torticollis and muscular dystonia. So the person is having acute muscular dystonia after taking haloperidol. So what is the next step? So we know antipsychotic drugs, they act by blocking D2 receptor. And when we block D2 receptor more than required in the brain, that can lead to extra pyramidal symptoms. So dystonia, stoticolis are examples of extra pyramidal symptoms. So basically there was balance in the brain of dopamine and acetylcholine. So we have blocked D2 receptor, this become imbalance. So now we have to block muscarinic receptors also. So what we need to do, we need to add muscarinic receptor blocker so that these symptoms can be taken care of and the drug which are muscarinic receptor blocker are drugs like benzhexone which is normally used. Another drug we can use is benzotropin. So benzhexone or benzotropin, they are drug of choice for dystonia caused by antipsychotic drugs. If these are not in the option, then you can mark the answer as promethazine also. It is an antihistaminic drug, but very strong anticholinergic property. Okay. So if we see the option, increased dose of haloperidol will not be done. Rather, it will worsen the symptoms. Remember, clozapine is a very toxic drug. It can cause agranulocytosis, seizures. So it is used for drug-resistant schizophrenia only. So we will not do that. Give flufenazine instead of haloperidol. Haloperidol and flufenazine belong to same group of drugs. So there is no point in changing the drug because same side effect will be with the both the drugs. Give benzotropin is the answer. Okay. So the answer here is benzotropin. Clear? What does it mean when a drug has bioavailability of 30%? Okay. So we discussed this in our lectures. So if we are giving a drug, suppose we have given 100 molecules by oral, the drug will come in the GIT and from here it will be absorbed, absorbed. Suppose 80 molecules are absorbed, they have come into the liver, but out of the 80, 20 molecules are not absorbed, they are excreted as such in the feces. Out of the 80, 50 molecules are metabolized in the liver. This is known as first pass metabolism. So rest of the 30 molecules reach here. So out of 100, 30% have reached the systemic circulation. That is called as bioavailability. So bioavailability is 
the percentage of given dose that reach the systemic circulation. So if we see the answer, it is 50% bioavailability means drug is 30% of drug reaches the systemic circulation. That is the answer. But if 30% is reaching the systemic circulation, does that mean 70% drug is first pass metabolized? No, rest of the 70% is wasted. So it can be wasted by not getting absorbed or it can be wasted by getting first pass metabolized. So two methods of wasting the drug. So if they are saying that 70% drug undergo first pass metabolism is not right. Remember, first pass metabolism may be 70%, but maybe less also because there is some contribution of not absorption also. So this is not the answer. Then these are not relevant. 30% drug is pure, not relevant. 30% is producing therapeutic potential potency, again, not. So answer will be 30% of drug reaches the systemic circle. Hope that is clear. Okay. So we can move to the next question. This is the preferred drug for treatment of post-menopausal breast cancer. Now, here there is some catch. If you see that if a breast cancer is estrogen receptor positive, so we need to stop estrogen receptor, block estrogen receptor. So we have two types of drugs that can be used for estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. One drug is a SAM, which is known as tamoxifen. tamoxifen. Another drug is called as aromatase inhibitors. Aromatase inhibitor like anastrozole, letrozole, etc. Now, normally, tamoxifen can be used in both premenopausal as well as postmenopausal. It can be used for treatment of both, but it is a drug of choice for premenopausal females. In postmenopausal female, it can be used. Whereas aromatase inhibitors are indicated only for postmenopausal females, but they are drug of choice in postmenopausal female. They are not indicated in premenopausal. Okay? So if we see the options here, which is the preferred drug for postmenopausal female? The answer should be aromatase inhibitors. But if we see there is no aromatase inhibitor, yes, there is aromatase inhibitor in the option. So anastrozole is the answer here. Anastrozole is an aromatase inhibitor. It is a drug of choice for postmenopausal breast cancer. If they have written premenopausal, then answer would have been tamoxifen. But tamoxifen can be used in postmenopausal also, but drug of choice will be an Okay. Methotrexate is a chemotherapy drug, not is drug of choice. Reloxifen is used in osteoporosis. Okay. So answer here is an Question: Which antitubercular drug cause visual problem? It's very easy. So this is the easiest of the question. We remember E for ethambutol, E for eye problems. So it causes optic neuritis. Optic neuritis, which can lead to red green color blindness. Red green color blindness, that is the side effect of ethambutol. Okay, and the important side effects of other drugs you can remember rifampicin is hepatotoxic. Apart from hepatotoxicity, it can cause flu like syndrome. Flu like syndrome. Isoniazid causes peripheral neuropathy and hepatotoxicity. Pyrazinamide is also hepatotoxic, but the special side effect you need to remember is hyperuricemia. Hyperuricemia. So, which cause visual problem? Answer will be E for ethambutol, E for eye problems. Okay. Which is the likely ECG changes noted with the use of beta coli? Remember, we discussed three new antitubercular drugs. One is beta coli, second is delamenide. And third is pretomenide. I told you to remember important points about these drugs. So what are important points? beta choline mechanism of action. It acts by inhibiting ATP synthase. So you can remember from the name. The name it contains bed. So it will make the bacteria bedridden. So why it will be bedridden? Because there is no energy. When ATP is not produced, the bacteria will be restricted to bed. So beta colin make the bacteria lie on the bed. Whereas delaminide and pretomenide, they act by inhibiting mycolic acid synthesis. 
in the mycobacteria and again the name says they act by inhibiting mycolic acid inhibitor they are mycolic acid inhibitor their name contains mainide is mycolic acid inhibitors okay so that is the mechanism then all the three drugs the side effect is common you need to remember all three drugs they cause qt prolongation in the ecg and excessive qt interval it can lead to torsades d point is torsades d point is okay so if you see to the options what is the ecg changes noted the answer will be qt prolongation so vidaquiline delaminide pretominide all are associated with qt prolongation okay last question a patient with history of hiv was started on antiretroviral therapy consisting of lamivudin 300 mg tenofovir 150 mg and dolutegravir 50 mg once daily at night few weeks later he developed tuberculosis and was started on anti tubercular drug what is change should be done so here i will tell you how to change the drugs in case of hiv with tb so if a patient is taking anti hiv therapy like the patient is taking a therapy which is known as tle that means tenofovir lamivudin and efavirenz tenofovir lamivudin efavirenz and patient started on rifampicin based rifampicin based att that means one of the anti tubercular drug is rifampicin important thing rifampicin do not affect these drugs so continue as such now no change is required if we start att okay now second thing if a person is taking another regime which is called as tld tenofovir plus lamivudin plus dolutegravir dolutegravir so what change you need to do is dolutegravir metabolism is induced by rifampicin so we will make the dose of dolutegravir double so what we will do rest will be same only thing will be we will use tenofovir lamivudin as such that means once a day but dolutegravir we will make it twice a day so after 12 hours we will add same dose that means earlier person was taking 50 mg we will give 50 mg more after 12 hours if the person was taking at night add in the morning okay now till the time person keeps on taking att continue same that means twice a day and till two weeks after stopping rifampicin so when rifampicin is stopped for two weeks will continue same after two weeks will make it od again okay now third if a person is taking a regime consisting of tenofovir lamivudin with some protease inhibitor some navir now there are two options navirs should not be given with rifampicin navirs cannot be given with rifampicin they will become ineffective so there are two options number one we can change this regime to tld so d again twice a day as we discussed earlier so change from tlpi to tld but if we cannot give d due to any reason and we want to continue tl and protease in a better then change rifampicin to rifabutin change rifampicin to rifabutin so these are the guidelines you need to follow okay revising if a person is taking tld no change continue same if a person is taking tld then what you need to do make the dose of d double d for double okay then if a person is taking tl plus protease in a better number one change to tld but if we cannot change to tld then change rifampicin to rifabutin okay so that is the guidelines so if we see the option here the person is taking t l and d so person was started on att so what we need to do to we will need to make d double d for double so what is d double so add dolutegravir 50 mg in the morning okay so that is the treatment of tb plus hi okay so this is about the questions which are asked in the fmg 2024 general thank you very much